What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I have David Kekich. Now, what would you do with an extra 20 or 30 youthful, energetic years? Does the thought of never dying from old age or even limitless youth sound like a fantasy? Now, imagine being smart, strong, and sexy at age 100. Today, we have David Kekich, who's a recognized authority on longevity science. He founded the Maximum Life Foundation in 1999 and is dedicated to curing aging-related diseases. You can find it at maxlife.org. He's also the CEO of Age Reversal Inc. and Psychog. Now, they have a team of world-renowned scientists and researchers working on cutting-edge health innovations. He's been featured in several prominent life extension documentaries, TV, radio, and as I mentioned, he's the author of Smart, Strong, and Sexy at 100, New Skin, New Hair, New You, Seven Simple Steps to Thrive at 100 and Beyond. I highly recommend it. Dave, thanks for being with me. Well, thank you, Jeremy. Thanks for having me. And uh, I guess you covered everything. So <laughs> We can end right now. There's nothing left. <laughs> you know, before Maximum, and we'll get into it, before Maximum Life Foundation, Dave actually founded a life insurance company and co-founded a major financial services company, which we'll talk about some of the big lessons there. And I always like to start off with a fun fact that most people don't know about you. And when I asked you about that, you said your imagination. Yeah, I, you know, I I don't really talk about that imagination very much because I kind of go over the line as far as most people are concerned with, you know, smart, strong and sexy at 100. Uh, open-ended youthfulness. I mean, that that's that's just really more than most people can digest. So I, I lose, <laughs> I lose people like you know, like you know, four words into the first sentence. It's a huge paradigm shift. Yeah, it, it's it's a major paradigm shift. And um, so I, I wish I could talk about what I think about, but I mean, I go way beyond. I mean, way beyond the things we're talking about right now. I just came back from speaking at a conference in Palm Springs and. It was a futurist conference, and there was a lot talk. A lot of us talked about life extension and uh, really extreme life extension, and mm-hmm. but they were talking about robotics and I mean on and on and on transhumanism, if you know what that is. And it was a pretty far out conference. Yeah, uh, that scares a lot of people. Yeah, and it scared some of the people who were there. Really, uh, one of the people that I was talking to is a prominent MD, uh, active in this space, big name, and uh, it just a little bit wasn't quite. Great for him. And, uh, you know, change is always tough. Yeah. Most people are pretty entrenched in the status quo. And uh, they're comfortable. Yeah. And people don't like to be pushed out of their comfort zones. Yeah. Now, comfort zones are something that we should take ourselves out of if we ever, ever want to go anywhere. And you have, I know, almost everybody I know has who's ever accomplished anything. But people don't like to be pushed out of their comfort zones. Yeah. And when you ever even hint or suggest that something that, that, that totally opposite of what they're very comfortable with, you get a lot of pushback. Mm-hmm. And um, but they're going to have to get used to it because it's, all this stuff is coming. Yeah. This this and more. And the um, it's happening faster, faster and faster and faster. You know, I got to tell you, I know what's coming. But there are so many things that are coming that I couldn't even imagine, that nobody knows. Mm-hmm. But I know I'm going to have a hard time adjusting. But my imagination, I'm, uh, you know, I fantasize. I, uh, uh, my imagination is bigger than my deeds and my words. But I'm taking steps to make those come true. I'm planning to make those all happen in realities. Yeah. I mean, again, like with some people will see the book or the title. And like you said, it may scare people. But there's... You know, if they sometimes know what you know, they may think like you think. You know, there's definitely bodies of research that are showing what's going on. People are doing, which we'll talk about some of the health advances that you've seen that if they saw that, it may blow their mind initially, but yeah. they could maybe see, you know, how you're saying what you're saying. 
What is one of those scary things that maybe someone at the conference that now we're going beyond the book, but at yeah, the, the well, Palm Springs conference, what you was might one of the, you're going to lose your audience right here. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, yeah, no. If, if we, if it gets us out of our comfort zone and that's all it does, then it's worthwhile. Yeah. I like to have people stretch whether they yeah. agree with me, don't agree with me. I know I don't agree with everything. Everybody tells me, even my friends, the people yeah. in my circle and I agree with others and um, it's a, you know, same with me. People some, sometimes agree with me or don't, but that's not the important issue. The important issue is we have the same common goals. Yeah. Uh, we have the same common direction we're going in. How we get there, what we say, how we do it, what our politics are, what you know, what our gender, anything. You know, none of that really matters. We try to find our commonalities, and the commonality with almost everybody I associate with now is they want they want more, yeah. and more is everything that's good in their lives including and especially their lives. Mm -hmm. They want more life. They want more youthfulness. They want more happiness, more strength, better sensory perception. I mean, they just want it all, more wealth. And there's an amazing future out there. And uh, as far as the, I guess the farthest out thing in the, um, in the conference yeah. was, well, there are some farther out things, but the farthest out thing that would pertain to individuals' personalities yeah. is uh, transhumanism and uh, enhancement, uh, physical enhancement. We're seeing a lot of these things now, a lot of these things you couldn't even think about talking about a few years ago, but now we're seeing a lot of this starting to happen. Prosthetics, for example. Uh, I see the day, and this wasn't covered in the conference, but I see the day when people might opt, opt to have their arms or legs amputated to be replaced by something that's artificial and because simply because it'd be, it's better mm -hmm. it could function better it wouldn't break down as easily yeah. uh, it could be much stronger look at uh, uh what's his name uh, oscar pretorius uh sure yeah Australia. i mean the guy just got they just let him out of jail but uh that's a whole other story but i mean from from the physical aspect sure you see what they accomplished with two prosthetic legs those are very very primitive to what we're going to be seeing in the near future hmm. So yeah. enhancements, uh, better vision. I mean, we were talking about things, at least one presenter was talking about things like people have body art now, tattoos, a lot of it. You see so much of it anymore. And you see so much more of it, even on, even, even on individual bodies, yeah. women, men, and everything. Well, uh, they were talking about body art in the future where you would have uh, sensors embedded, you would have chemicals or whatever would be not threatening to your health uh, or right. but like nanotechnology type of nanotechnology stuff. where yeah. you could almost uh, change your appearance at will hmm. it have things that don't even look human a face that looks art art you know just artsy and weird and that's only limited by your imagination right uh, so it, we're gonna see a lot of this stuff I love I love hearing that stuff and yeah, I transgenderism uh, most people are repulsed by that. But now um, people are coming out. Uh, uh, the uh, what's his name? Bruce um, Jenner. Bruce Jenner yeah. coming out with that. I just found out a friend of mine is transgender, and I'm I'm good with it. I you know I, I, years ago I'd have been shocked and I wouldn't I would would have thought less of him. But now you know what? That's his choice. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's but we're going to see a lot of people opting for things like that at some point in the future. We may be able to actually change our biological genders. Yeah. We may be able to do that. Uh, I wouldn't want to be a woman even for a day, but I, I would like to experience some of those things, have a sensory experiences just to understand, just, well, maybe I could figure women out. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> Somebody asked me one time if, uh, if, if, if uh, I thought artificial intelligence, because that's one of my fields, right. would ever... Um, you know, if, if I could, you know, you know, take it over, figure out women. And I said, no. <laughs> I said, you know, the generation we're having now, the generation after that, the generation after that, they said, it, it, would, it wouldn't have a clue. <laughs> that should be the title of this interview is, he could figure out how he could live forever. He could figure out artificial intelligence. He cannot figure out women. <laughs> exactly. Right? No matter how long you live. Live long enough to figure out women, which would be an eternity. <laughs> or women, men. <laughs> um, you know, it makes me want to ask, so it makes me want to engage in this conversation, the imagination part. I like that. Who do you think would be the people, like you said, you predict, or you think maybe in the future people will opt to have their limbs amputated? 
Do you think that will be well, an they athlete? May. They, they may. Right, I they may, yeah. I think there's going to be something better, but I was right. using that as an example yeah. of something that uh, will be will be commonplace. Yeah, I'm curious. Like, you think the first people to do it are just people who are scientists and experimenting, or athletes who just want to get to the next level? Well, I think the first people to do it will be the first pe the, the people that already have amputations or non functional or right. uh, unfunctional limbs, and they will do it just like the ones that are yeah. getting prosthetics now. But when they start out performing, other people. Uh, yeah. Then you have a whole new issue. If it's, if they're athletes, uh, where do you draw the line? What do you? Where they? I mean, is it human? Is it a, uh, part human, part robot? What? It, what is it? Right. Um, uh, as as you, you would probably you would shouldn't ever lose your self sense of self awareness or who you are, your personality or whatever. Or you might you know it might change a little bit, but if you chop off an arm, it's it, uh, it's still Jeremy. If you chop off a leg, it's still Jeremy. Right. Uh, so if you start having these things replaced, but the arms and the legs wouldn't be Jeremy's, they, they, they would be now, you'd own them, right. they would be your biological parts. So um, I think there are going to be better ways, I think we're going to be able to enhance our biological selves, Yeah. so we wouldn't have to do that, but uh, you know, maybe the artificial would be better. Yeah, you know, we'll talk about a little bit about your, your credo. And I feel like you should come up with a credo of this imagination future ideas if you haven't already. I'd love to read that. I, I, I haven't. I should actually. Uh, yes. I, I did make a couple of edits because Joe Polish and I have been promising each other that we'd turn that into a book now for years. And uh, we finally started to do it. And after, after about two days, we ran out of time. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I, I think the. No, no, no we're, we're going to do it. But I, I, I did change a couple of the Trita, Tritas, updated it just a little okay. bit, and, and we did find a, a writer to a uh, ghost writer for us, and then we'll just edit it. But I mean, I'll, you know, we're writing things for him. I guess I'm already writing things nice. for him. I want to hear about, you know, there's a great story. Uh, yeah, I read your book or listened to it. And how did you come up? There's a great story about how you came up with the title of the book. Uh, I was, first of all, I wanted to convey the message in the book, what the book was all about, without going too far. So there's actually a question mark at the end of Smart, Strong, and Sexy at 100. Right. So I leave that, at least I leave my leave people up and say, well, maybe this is true, maybe it's not, let's see what it's all about. Right. Um, as, as we get older, uh, if we're paying attention, we all get smarter. But at a certain point, most of us start to decline in old age. Uh, it, to the point where if, you, if we live long enough, most of us today would have some sort of dementia, Alzheimer's. We have five, over 5 million Alzheimer's the patients in this country alone. They don't live very long. And um, then they're replaced by other ones. So not only are, do we want to reverse Alzheimer's, we're actually going to be doing some uh, clinical trials, uh, maybe this year, where we supposed to, for that possibility. And, uh, but, and, and reverse dementia, but to being able to prevent it. But not only that, uh, to take people who are already starting to slide, say they're 70 or 80 or 90, and bring them back to the mental state, physical too, of where they're, say, 50. I just right. pick a number. I'm just picking 50. Right. And someday it'll be better. But uh, we're a lot sharper at 50. At least we have better reactions. Uh, we have better memories, things like that. We might not know as much at 50 than we do at 70, but we, we function better. So uh, I want to bring that, I think that's really important because that's one of the biggest fears. As you grow older, you lose, you start to lose your sense of self at some point. My dad was like that. I had him with me up until a couple of days before he died. Mm. And uh, boy, it was, I mean, he just lost, after not knowing who I was, he would have flashes where he'd remember sort of, kind of. But at the end, he didn't even really have a sense of mm. self. He didn't have, didn't know who he was or where he was or whatever. He was tough, just, yeah. Yeah. And that's, a, that's frightening. That is absolutely frightening. And when people start to lose their glasses or when they lose their car keys or when they forget a name or a face, uh, it's the first indication. We all do it at point points in our lives, but we're so much more sensitive to it in older age that it's a big, big fear. It's, it's more of a fear to do that with most people than actually to have a heart attack and die. Yeah. Cancer, cancer is a big fear. Yeah. And you were giving a talk yeah. Oh, sorry, a, go ahead. I was of a group then, of, of. I'm sorry, but that, then uh, strong, smart, strong, strong and sexy, same thing. Yeah. Be able to bring people back, and sexy is relative. Uh, but you know, whatever you're, you know, <laughs> no matter who you are, you could be, uh, you, know, you could be a, a hot runway model, and most of most people's 
sense of themselves is, hey, I'm not sexy. They see all the flaws. But they want, they, everybody wants to get better looking, and it's mm -hmm. crazy. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you a story about that in a little bit. Go ahead, yeah. Well, I, I, about the, uh, the conference, you asked me the, the story about the conference that yes. I was speaking at. Uh, I was, it was a Harbecker conference. Do you know Harvey? You know Harvey, don't you? I know yeah. him, yeah. It was years ago, and he had it close to me in uh, Irvine, California. And I guess there were you know, 1,200, 1,300 people or something like that. It was a big crowd. And his conferences aren't cheap. So this was a health and wellness conference. Yeah. People came from all over the country, paid travel expenses, hotel, and then, I don't know, four or $500 or whatever he charged to get into the conference. So these were people looking for health tips. So I got up and I was talking about the things I do and the things you can do to improve your health and longevity and started talking about stem cell research. And I was saying things like, well, imagine when you're getting older and you're slowing down and you have congestive heart failure. How about, how about a new heart or a rejuvenated heart or a younger heart? Oh, yeah. Ooh. You know, I'm hearing murmurs. You know, people are nodding in approval. And I did the same thing for some other organs. And then I said, imagine 25-year-old skin. That place erupted. I mean, people went crazy. This wasn't people. They came to a cosmetics show. Oh, yeah. These are people looking to live longer or to feel better or to be healthier. Yet, they, when I said skin, my God, the, the top blew off the place. I mean, the just it was crazy. So I learned a really valuable lesson right there. And Joe Polish, Joe Polish actually put it in words, in a different, not thinking about that experience. But you might have heard him say, sell people what they want and give them what they need. Right, yeah. Now, what he means by that is package what they need in what they want, show them the benefits. So if I want to sell somebody the prospect of living a lot longer and a lot healthier, because most people will not do anything to prevent. Most people uh, now that are, 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 are just ruining the days they spent lying, under the, lying in the sun, uh, working on a tan, and all of a sudden wrinkles show up in old age. Well, they could have prevented that, but I mean, they're out there playing golf or going, you know, swimming or playing volleyball on the beach or just lying there getting a tan to look good. Yeah. Well, now they're not looking so hot, and they want to fix. They want to fix the problem that already happened, and um, so whenever I, I, I want to present something or couch, I, I try to couch it in what the big wants are. What they want, they, yeah. I mean, yeah, scratch that itch, but at the same time bring them something that's really going to help. And in my book, I, I show people how they can live five to 15 years longer uh, and get more enjoyment out of life. That doesn't seem like much, or it seems like a lot to some people, but what I'm really giving them is a chance to be on that train, I guess you might call it, or the boat that's going to take them to super longevity, because we're getting close. We're closing in on some things now that if people live another couple of years, another five years, maybe one more year, yeah. or keep them from being left behind. They just won't have, uh, they won't have the opportunity to take advantage of some of the new technologies yeah. that might be released shortly after they die. Yeah. So um, you sell them uh, nicer skin or better, more energy, and they end up giving them an open-ended, uh, <laughs> youthful lifespan. <laughs> yeah. Dave, what are you most excited about? What research are you seeing? What health advances are you most excited about? Man, there are two. Um, the two big ones are uh, artificial intelligence. And the reason I say that is the human body is extremely complex. We have, let's see, we have about 20,000 protein encoding genes in our bodies. And proteins are what make us who we are, you know, what we look like, how tall we are, how smart we are. Uh, how long we're going to live, on and on and on. It makes you, you, and me, me. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the genes and proteins. Well, how they're expressed. Well, uh, proteins express about 100,000, or genes express about 100,000 different proteins. And we have, I don't know, depending on who you talk to, roughly everybody's different, but roughly 40 trillion cells in our body. Right. And each cell has something like uh, 100,000 proteins in it. And each cell, uh, cells are replaced, about one million died and replaced every second. These 
these biochemical reactions that are going to quadrillions of these things are going on all the time. And we can't even put a small dent in what we're learning right. through, um, through uh, genome engineering and, or, uh, and mapping the human genome. We right. map the proteome, which is even more complex, the biome. Uh, the, the the proteins and the and the and the you know the the the, bio, uh, the bacteria in your gut, for example, on your skin. I mean, there that just adds to the complexity. So we can, as as individuals and even as teams of researchers and students and just the lay public, we can get the mechanisms of these things, but the intricacies of how they all work, how they fit together, what affects, what, 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 what reaction here affects this over there. Well, only the most powerful artificial intelligence will be able to figure that out. Mm -hmm. not, not just powerful computers, but powerful computers with a powerful mind that thinks like a human. Yeah. And we're actually doing that now with PSYCOG systems. We're um, in the process of building an artificial scientist which will, within two or three years from the time we finish our funding raise, our fundraise, uh, we, we plan on having every single bit of longevity research in one major database. And that's plants and animals. And once we have that, uh, we can't rest. I mean, the AI can't rest because we're doubling our knowledge every year, roughly. Right. Not knowledge, but it really doesn't equate to knowledge. It's probably a, a, a bad word to use. We're, we're, we're doubling our our uh, our information, our data, every year. I mean, this year, we we will have accumulated as much data as we've accumulated since the beginning of history. Right. And we'll do it again next year. Keep doubling. Right. And, and the double the the, the exponent. You know, the, it'll be doubled every year. Or pretty soon, it'll be doubled every ten months or nine months. So uh, there's always something new, new information coming in. And we can't even imagine, for the most part, how much information we have, let alone try to harness it. Only an AI can figure that out. Right. So uh, we're working on that yeah. to speed up every bit of research, not yeah. only longevity, but every, every bit of research within the longevity realm, and also every bit of research in any other scientific endeavor. We'd like to have someday have every bit of scientific information in one big database. And yeah. that's... That's a, that's a longer term goal. Yeah. Yeah. I want to hear about the second thing. So what you're seeing with artificial intelligence essentially is creating computer that thinks like a human. Yep. Yeah. It's creating a software more software. Yeah. Than thinks like a human. Yeah. yeah reasons. Uh, we've already got an early version of this. It, it, to some extent reasons, but it makes discoveries. Hmm. We've got some amazingly powerful computers. Now Watson is an example. Watson's incredibly good and almost instantaneously finding existing answers to questions and, and, and integrating some of those answers. But it's not built to, to well, maybe learn as you accumulate the stuff, but it's not really built to think. It's built to search. Now, don't, I'm, not, I'm not diminishing Watson by any means. It's, it's an incredible breakthrough. Yeah, and, and it's going to get better. But someday it'll have what we're working on, and that's the ability to make discoveries, just like a human researcher, to create new knowledge. Yeah, and we're working in that direction right now. Already made, already made some demonstrable uh, proof. That's amazing. So what's yeah. the se what's the second thing? You said there were two. Gene therapy. Gene therapy. Gene therapy. Company called BioViva Sciences, mm -hmm. and. Um, we only, I mentioned we have 20,000 protein encoding genes. Well, BioViva is actually working with two. One gene and the variation of the technique on how it's delivered and where it's delivered has the potential of reversing Alzheimer's. Hmm. Now, that is so huge. Uh, it's almost unimaginable for most people, not yeah. only in a uh, hum in, in a in a in a in a human, um, humanistic approach, but also an economic approach. I mean, look at our healthcare system right now. It's broken. It's just killing us. It's sinking our economy, uh, eating up so much of our of our money. Well, what if we uh, just what if we cured Alzheimer's, or at least slow down the progression? And this this has the potential of preventing it. For the people that already have it, potentially reversing it, 
and keeping them from getting it again. Yeah. The people who don't have it just take away that fear of ever having it. These these are expensive uh, procedures, by right. the way. Beginning, we're going to be doing, it, but the price will come way down. Actually, we're the company that um, we want to put ourselves out of business, and and the reason I say that is we want to get this down to the point, the price down to the point where it would be foolhardy for any government or any health insurance company to not give it free to their citizens or to their policyholders, right. because they'll save so much more over and above. Right. Uh, what they would pay for it. In addition yeah. to keeping people in the labor force, you know, these are the smartest people for the most part because they're older. I mean, if they're, if they're halfway paying attention, they have a lot more knowledge, a lot more experience, better networks, better everything. Yeah. And they disappear. You know, well, we can preserve those. Uh, the other one, the other gene, uh, well, that gene also, another application of that could potentially reverse aging. It's reversed aging in every single human tissue that it's ever been. Um, it's ever been put into in in, uh, in test tube in in, uh, in vitro. Uh, we're going, for the first time we're going to give it to they call it systemic, uh, systemically they we're going to give it to a person to get into their whole body. So we're going to do that. Uh, sit back and see what happens. How do you administer that? How does that get administered like systemically? Uh, it, it's it's uh, intramuscular injections. Okay. A series of them. Uh, the whole the whole treatment would take probably less than an hour. Wow. And we're going to have. Uh, we're going to have a subject treated, uh, I don't know, maybe September, August. That's wild. Yeah, and, and within a year, we'll see what happens. Wow. <laughs> we, want, we want to bring this to the world, and we want to eliminate, to the best of our ability, disease and sickness and, and of course, death from aging. We'll yeah. die from something else, but uh, certainly not aging yeah. at some point. This may be the key. The other one... Uh, the other gene uh, has the potential to clear out uh, arterial plaque. Hmm. Heart disease is our biggest killer. It takes up about one, uses up about one third of our uh, healthcare costs. Right. And what if we could eliminate that or greatly reduce it? Eliminating is a stretch, but yeah. what if we could reduce that dramatically? It's yeah. Just off the charts. Yeah. Look at the suffering that we would, uh, that people would avoid. Yeah, uh, and you almost seem like the perfect background to do something like this because you have the background in insurance. And also with the venture capital raising funds, because this is yeah. a very costly undertaking, you know, yeah, to say we, the we, least. We raise en enough money to uh, do the first subjects. We're also going to do a couple of small pets. And um, but with the pet market, we'll let people pay for that. With the uh, with the other markets, the human markets, let's let the insurance companies pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> people care about their pets sometimes more than their their, well, their own health. health. That's that's for sure. Yeah. Um, so how far away do you think it is for the Alzheimer's gene therapy? We, we plan on treating, we have a pledge for enough money to treat uh, three patients right now. Hmm. And we want to do 10, so we want to, uh, but we can start, I'd say, within three months. Well, that's remarkable. Yeah, and we should have the results back. Early results, maybe four months. But then we, we don't know how long it will take but, uh, for the optimal results, but we should... It should all mature within yeah. a year or so. Yeah, that's mind-blowing stuff. What's something, again, you mentioned a few things in the book, too, that I think will blow people's minds as far as health advances. You talk a little bit about almost printing organs. Yeah, well, they're still kind of doing that now at Wake Forest, tuning yeah. it all. Yeah. What do you see printing. with that? We're familiar with 3D printing, I think, right? Yeah. Well, uh, one of the first applications was printing organs. Uh, you take you feed it by bio, you know bio, biological material, uh, a person's autologous stem cells, for example. That means your own autologous is not somebody else's, not embryonic. And uh, you you want to build a a new lung or a new bladder, which is uh, they did it without the 3D printing the first time, first wow. few times around trachea. Uh, those are already done implanted, functional, incredible stuff. It's incredible. <laughs> and, and yeah, working on uh, lungs, uh, working on kidneys and hearts. Uh, they're, they're more, they're much more uh, livers. They're much more complex because they're solid. But we're getting there. We just keep getting there. You know, new things every day. It's just amazing. It's hard to keep up. Yeah, it is. That's amazing stuff. And also, I wanted you to talk a little bit about some of the research in the field because there was one person you mentioned in the book who had been doing research for thirty-four years, saying that. 
you can't reverse aging. And then he changed what he said. Michael Rose. Yeah. Yeah. What uh, made him Michael change? Rose, one of the brightest guys I know, one of the most productive. Yeah, he's an evolutionary biologist. And he tried to prove that we can't reverse aging and prove to himself that we can. And he wrote a book called, End, I think it's Ending Aging. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, he, he did some incredible things. He, he actually uh, bred fruit flies, which are surprisingly a good model for human aging, human biology. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think the aging genes are almost 90% or a little bit over 90% in common with humans. That's amazing. Yeah. And over, the, over about 40 years, almost 40 years, through generation after generation, thousands of generations of fruit flies, what he did was he didn't let them reproduce until they, until almost all of them died off. So then he would take the ones, he'd keep them separate, male and female. And when most of them, die, almost all of them died off, he'd put them in the same cage and let them reproduce. He did this a few thousand times, uh, and over the, it was his assistants did, or his students did, but he did all the work at the beginning and they're living about four times longer now wow. than the average fruit fly and we've actually not we but actually I was involved in this uh, indirectly uh, found the genetic basis for why they you know what the, what the difference is genetically between them and the other fruit flies so we wanted to get some insights into uh, eight human aging genes and we've, we found that we found what was it. the difference genes it's just mu gene mutations uh, we took a look at 17, going to a human model, uh, nothing that dramatic, four times as long, but do uh, you know what a supercentenarian is? I'm assuming, I'm not sure exactly how well, long they A centenarian is somebody that lives to 100. Right. A supercentenarian is someone that makes it to 110 or mm, older. Got it. And there are only about 70 in the whole world hmm. That are validated. There, there are probably other ones, but yeah. only those those validated. A lot of claims, mm -hmm. but some are debunked. Yeah. And um, we found uh, the AI using the AI. Uh, we actually uh, there's a major genetic university, uh, one of the biggest ones in the world, had this data for almost two years, and they were trying to find the genetic difference between supercentenarians and and the uh, right. uh, smear mortals. <laughs> yeah. And 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 they uh, they came up pretty pretty much inconclusive. Really. We got, we got the same data, uh, worked on it with our team and with our AI assisting the team, and we found several gene mutations that occur only in supercentenarians, mm. and we found a couple of hundred uh, gene combinations that contribute, apparently contribute to aging or youthfulness one way or the other, and now we're just in the middle of validating all this, but yes, we found clues mm. into why we age, and we're... And, by finding those clues, now we have ways to develop drugs, nutraceuticals, cosmeceuticals, mm -hmm. and especially, my favorite, gene therapy. So uh, there's this. There's so much more to learn. I mean, yeah. it just we're just at, at the we're just scratching the surface, yeah. but make some incredible results with just those little. Yeah, surfaces. yeah. One of my favorite books is The Blue Zones, which oh, yeah. Which, yeah. which talks about yeah. some of those some of those things as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that gets into, you mentioned a few things about supplements. I'm curious, what do you do in your health regimen that surprises people? Um, and I'm curious also what supplements you take. Well, I take a lot. What surprises most people is the amount of supplements I take. Okay. And uh, I have them actually all in my book. I have it all outlined in there, but I take. The other thing that surprises people is why I uh, am on a paleo diet. Uh -huh. Have been for about five years now. Yeah. No grains, no sugars. I mean, no sugar, the sugar, no, almost everything, but no added sugar, no, no processed sugars. food, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no legumes, uh, things like that. But the, um, the the main reason I'm on it, getting back, it goes back to Michael Rose, the evolutionary biologist. Uh, he determined that we just haven't adapted. We haven't had enough time to adapt to these foods. Well, Twinkies kill us, for example. <laughs> right. But if we ate them. For a hundred thousand years, we would adapt, and they would actually be good for us. But it would take about that long, maybe fifty thousand at least. I don't know if they'd ever be good for us. I don't know if you. <laughs> oh no! Surprisingly, they probably would be. Really? Because we would learn our 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 genome would adjust and adapt, but it would take tens of thousands of years. It would take you know so many generations. Right. Well, 
that's basically the grains were maybe not, they weren't as bad, but grains 5,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago, depending on where your ancestors are from, usually seven or eight, were the Twinkies <laughs> of the, the, uh, right. the dawn of the agricultural age. Right. We're, we're not really adapted to them, but the, the main reason is Michael has also found a correlation uh, between uh, the rate of aging and the um, and, and 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 the the things that you're putting into your system, and he found that if you go back to your paleo roots, we'll never go back to them because everything has changed. Somewhat processed. Uh, yes. I mean, foods have changed. Yeah. Uh, they've been engineered, and they've been whatever. Uh, a lot of hybrids, but um, but still, I mean, there are some basic rules, and if we if, if we eliminate some of these things from our diet, not only diet, if you adopt a paleo or um, caveman lifestyle. That means exercise. Basically a lot of walking uh, and sprinting and carry, you know, heavy lifting, carrying things and then resting. Yeah. And a whole, a whole study on that. But he found that the rate of aging will actually change. Uh, it's a plateau. Uh, it goes up, up, up exponentially and at some point, maybe around age 60, uh, it'll plateau and you won't stop aging but your rate of aging won't accelerate. So when you get when you get up to in your 80s and especially 90s, and boy, when you get up in your 100s, you just don't have much of a life expectancy because the, 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 a major portion, a percentage of those people will die in any given year, and maybe not a major, but a significant percentage will die in any given year. When you get over 110, it's about 50-50, wow. and then it keeps, keeps getting. But, but if, if you hit a certain age, and if you've been doing the right things, for say at least say ten or twenty years before that age, maybe maybe sixty, sixty-five, your rate of aging should not change. So I think that'll buy us a lot of time. And then when you start plugging regenerative medicine into the equation that we talked about, uh, replacement organs, but pretty soon just enhancing the organs with your own cells, yeah. learning how to repair them without replacing them. Um, that's not the holy grail, but that's the next step. Holy grails are somewhere beyond that right but we're going to continue making progress and yeah after a certain point we're going to be hitting a, a, a longevity escape velocity that mm. Aubrey Ray and Ray Kurzweil like to talk about and that's where we add one more uh, we add more than a year to your expected lifespan every calendar year so right. your rate of aging moves away from you right. so you Say so, say so you're closing in on you know it's, it, in, yeah. instead of your your day of reckoning closing in on you you know it keeps getting farther and farther away yeah barring accidents yeah <laughs> right so Dave I know you take a lot of supplements I take a lot of supplements if you had to eliminate all of them and just for people who what would you say the top two if someone didn't do anything else what would you tell people just do these two if you had to choose I hate to pick two but certainly um, D three. Vitamin D3 would be one. And I think a good quality fish oil would be the other. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, there's a study out of UC Riverside that says uh, animals fed fish oil uh, don't live quite as long <laughs> as animals that are fed it. But there's usually something to confound those studies. Uh, but uh, we're not looking for maximum lifespan. We're not looking to extend that because we're not going to do it with supplements. Nobody's going to live longer than the longest lived people because of supplements. Right. After age 90 or so, your, your genes have almost so completely taken over. Mm -hmm. And you can live a really healthy lifestyle, but if you don't have the genes, you're not gonna make it to yeah. 100. Yeah. I wanna go back to where this all started, you growing up, but before I do, I think it's important to, I don't like to, to harp on it, but there's common objections that people see about living sure. longer. You know, what are some of the most common ones that you see that people object to? Overpopulation, lack of resources, things like that. Yeah. You know, what, what are we going to do with all the people? Um, we're going to run out of resources. Those are the two big ones. Yeah. Yeah, and people should listen to the book because there's obvious um, scientific research and answers for that, and along with there's a frequently asked questions uh, page on maxlife.org that they can check out. But I think it's important to... You know, people may be thinking, well, what about this or what about that or, you know, what's going to happen to the population? You know, and you have definite answers to those to those I, questions. I, have, I think I covered at least 10 objections. Yes, yes. So, um, so going back to where this all started, where are you from originally? 
Johnstown, Pennsylvania, okay. uh, southwestern Pennsylvania, small town, steel town, or, or originally a coal town, or at least the area was a coal area. Uh, they built a steel, Bethlehem Steel came in uh, back in the 1800s, and, or maybe early 1800s, and started uh, processing uh, the steel because it was close to the coal. Yeah. And, and your dad was a steel worker, right? I, I was a steel worker, yeah. So what did you learn from your dad early on? Oh, man. Uh, character, uh, hard work, uh, dedication, love, Yeah, power who, of it. Who else was a big influence for you growing up? Growing up, uh, Arnold Palmer. Arnold Palmer? Uh, yeah, I, I used to think I was a good golfer, yeah. <laughs> So I gravitated to Arnold Palmer. Now he was not only the king of golf, or the king that was his nickname, yeah. but he happened to grow up and still lives uh, his his primary home uh, about thirty miles from my house in oh, Lake, really? Lake Trobe, Pennsylvania. Yeah, and I uh, I really admired him. He was a role model, and not because he was a great golfer. He and he was. He wasn't the best. Yeah. Or maybe a short time he was, and then Nicholas came in, and Nicholas was better. But, and Nicholas had, had class too, but Palmer, just the way he carried himself, the way he lived his life, mm-hmm. the, um, he, had, he had character. Uh, he, knew how to, he knew how to connect with people. He was a real genuine, classy guy, mm-hmm. yet he was just one of the guys. He never lost that. Mm. And real hard worker, dedicated, focused. Yeah. So what did you, when you were younger, what did you want to be? When you grew up, <laughs> professional golfer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wanted to be a professional golfer, but I had it hammered into me to be uh, upper, upper, uh, middle, upper management in a large corporation for security. Um, the things that my dad didn't have, so I wouldn't have to get my hands dirty. Mm-hmm. And he worked real hard to get me through school. Um, as it turned out, uh, security. Uh, one of my one of my mentors uh, had a, one of his. He had a lot of sayings, but one of them is security is the lowest form of happiness. Hmm. And uh, I find your that, credos, I think. Yeah, yeah, and I find that people who gravitate towards security and make that a goal in their life end up with uh, a failed goal in a failed life because it's so easy to have a the rug pulled out from under you. Yeah, we see. Look at Bethlehem Steel. That's where my dad worked. After a while, it closed the plant. Everybody got laid off. Wow. So there's no security. The best security, I mean, I shouldn't say, the best security is to make your own security. Right. Uh, be an entrepreneur. I, that's another lesson I learned at, uh, when I was in the life insurance business. Uh, the people that had the money, yeah. the people that had the best lifestyles, were the people that owned their own businesses. Yeah. And those were the people that, uh, that bought the biggest insurance policies. Yeah. What changed that thinking in you? Because obviously... The mentality you said growing up was you just wanted to be in, in management. What changed you to that, that way of thinking? Uh, my first job. I, I got a job uh, in, uh, in a telephone. Well, I was working for Chesapeake and Potomac Telephone Company out of Charleston, West Virginia, when I, after I graduated. And uh, the corporate structure was rigid. I wasn't. Um, I was... A little bit rebellious and independent growing up, uh, in some ways kind of a jerk, uh, but never really a troublemaker. But I, I got into my, you know, I got into my my share, but nothing really really harmful. Uh, but, but no, I, I just found that I didn't like the uh, didn't, I didn't like taking orders for one thing. I hated the army, yeah. and uh, I liked to be able to make my own decisions. And I didn't really realize that until I started working. For somebody else, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, I worked for two companies, uh, one there and then one in California. Worked for the telephone company for less than a year and a half. Yeah. yeah. Who? So, who is Dr. Andrew Galambos, and what was his influence? Oh my God, Dr. Galambos. Uh, we playfully called him AJ, but not to his face. Uh, A.J. Golombos, Andrew J. Golombos. Uh He was an astrophysicist, and he started a school, a university actually, and it was uh, it was called Lions, uh, uh, Liberal Institute of Natural Science, 
but then it was under that umbrella was the Free Enterprise Institute. So that's what this university was. Yeah. And it was a university out of rented out of a rented building. And it was one big classroom and he had all, all his courses in that one classroom. And they they lasted they started in the evening after dinner. I used to come home from work, go to the gym, eat on the fly, uh, drive to this class or classes, because I took a series of them. Yeah. And we'd get there, you know, I don't know, I, forget, I can't remember what time they started, but just say 8 o'clock, and right. we'd roll out of there sometimes at daylight. Really? I mean, like six, like 5 on, in the on. morning? Oh, yeah. He, he would, <laughs> we used to call them his commercial breaks. He, he'd say, okay, you can take a break now, and then he'd go off into a tangent. But it was so relevant to everything that he talked about that I wanted to hear. We would, most of us were just riveted. At what he was saying, we'd yeah. lose all track of time, and normally it wouldn't be done. But there were days when I drove home, and it was getting light out. Wow! And then get up and go to work, all charged up. Uh, learned a lot about free enterprise. He actually was the biggest influence on my life. Uh, learned a lot. He took the scientific method and applied them to uh, social issues. He virtually, at least hypothetically on paper, solved every major volitional issue where you have the concept of your own um, steering your own ship and the, the, the concept of how society works, how, the, how politics work, how things get done and why things don't get done. But he applied the law, he applied the scientific method to all this and he came up with radically yet elegant Simple solutions yeah. to virtually everything, yeah. and uh, and his. But that goes on and on. I mean, yeah. it, we would go hours and hours and Let's hours. Let's do it. No, <laughs> um, and I'll post the scientific method. What that is in the in the notes, so people kind of know what that what that is. Yeah, it's actually my. It's in it's in my credo. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. So, how did you even discover him? I mean, that seems like a random. I'm going to work, and then I'm going to go to this free enterprise institute. I actually found him through some friends, my business partner, and we were. I met him originally because what, a big a big uh, influence around my life was Ayn Rand. Yeah, and she's very controversial. Sure, and she was kind of a hard ass. You know, <laughs> I mean, she wasn't easy to, to to work around and live with, but uh, but she was tough and she was logical. A lot of people don't like her ideas. And, uh, and, that, and she wasn't perfect by any means, and she admitted that in her personal life. But she really stuck to her philosophy in her business and in her philosophy the way she lived. I mean, she smoked, for example, and she died from lung cancer. Well, that was horrible. Hmm. Um, she should have known better. But, boy, she was spot on. She came from communist Russia, from the Soviet Union, and um, just couldn't stand it. She hated she identified the problem. She identified why people were unhappy. She identified where there were shortages of all this. And she came to the freest place that there was at that time in, in the world, and that's the U.S. And she uh, found a home here, and she started identifying why uh, socialism is bad and capitalism is good. And Yeah, I see. Yeah. So up until then, now there are some things that she taught me that I since don't agree with, but 98% of it I do. Yeah. But, but, but then Columbus took that to a whole new level. He took a lot of her concepts, but other people's concepts too. But where she, where she identified problems, uh, and I'm not sure if you read anything, but her, she didn't really have solutions for them. She identified the problems. Left it up to you to find solutions. Like, thanks. Columbus, thanks for telling Columbus me now. Had, yeah, just, just operate. You know, if you run your life this way, things will, they kind of do. They kind of fall into place. Uh, but Columbus took that to a whole new level. I mean, he, he figured out solutions to everything. Yeah. It was funny. Uh, we somebody brought uh, a John Galt speech up in her book Atlas Shrugged. It was the most uh, interesting yet the most boring, painful speech I ever got, went to get. Uh, did, did you ever read Atlas at Shrugged? Okay. Well, when John Galt's speech was so jam packed full of energy and uh, common sense and uh, it, it just invaluable information, philosophical slants on things. Logic. I mean, everything was all wrapped into the speech, but it went on. I don't know. Like, so please finish. Atlas Shrugged is a long book. Yeah, a long book, twelve hundred, fourteen hundred pages or something. Uh, and 
somebody mentioned something about his speech to Golombos, and I don't know if he got it right, but he started quoting a part of the speech that this person referred to, and he went on for several paragraphs. Wow. Do you need a photographic memory or what? Had, absolutely had one, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But he said when uh, when he finished that book, he, he cried. Really? Because the reason he cried was because there was no more to read. So, <laughs> wow. Yeah. So he, and if you look at him, if you knew him, you would think yeah. he is the, the toughest, the most hard-shelled person you ever met. And inside there, boy, he was sensitive, and he was very sensitive to all the problems we're facing, and he was sensitive to, I mean, crying when the, when the book ended. Right. Uh, he's a very sensitive guy, yeah. yeah. He was very empathetic. So what else from those late-night sessions do you still think about today? Boy, you know, it's, it's hard to pick out anything because I try to integrate a lot of it into my life. Yeah. And I don't even really think about it. I hopefully do some of this stuff second nature. Uh, but I, I, I just don't think of any. It's been so long. Yeah. You just uh, ingrained it into your life. Ayn Rand? Yeah. So Ayn Rand taught me to think, hopefully rationally. Uh, a lot of the uh, credo came from Columbus, a lot of the points that he came up with there. And uh, I, I don't know how, how. I mean, he lived his philosophy. Uh, he I, I, and I, I, I hope to live my credo. It's hard work, and I can't say I do. It's it's a guide that I, I try to follow. Right. And the reason I wrote it down was originally it was for myself because I made some stupid mistakes and lost a lot of money and uh, wanted to figure out what I did. So I just started writing all the things that I learned in life, and then I yeah. modified them over the years and kept updating it. And uh, but I wrote it down for myself so I can keep reminding myself when anything went wrong, when I made a mistake, when something didn't. You know, I get back there. Sure. sure. Sure enough, I screwed up. My fault. I knew better, and mm-hmm. uh, try not to do it again. But Columbus went uh, made a phone call one time from a payphone, and this is the, how honest this guy was. The, the 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 quarter came back, or whatever. I think it was a quarter. The quarter came back. It didn't go through. So he called up the operator to see how he could return the quarter, wow. and. She couldn't give him an answer. And he went on and on trying to figure out how to get this quarter returned. <laughs> he finally just put it in the mail and mailed it to the telephone company. Wow. Because he didn't earn it. They just came to him. That's he didn't wild. steal it. He didn't earn it. It was somebody else's property. He had a very strong respect for people's property. Yeah. Uh, including the, uh, what's in your mind, including your original ideas, everything you own intellectually, everything you own. Call that primary property. Secondary property was um, whatever you, yeah. you things you own, the, the house you live in, the cars you have, your toys. Uh, and primordial property is your your life. Yeah. So you had three classes of property. So Dave, how many people were in that class that you were taking? Gosh, you know, um, they were different classes, different courses. Uh-huh. Um, I'm thinking. 70, 80. So it was a lot. Okay, I'm picturing like a small group. So it's, no, there was quite a few. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So what was next? What was next? Um, when did the insurance company that you started come into play? Well, it wasn't an insurance company. I had a master general agency for a company called uh, Executive Life. It was owned by a company called First Exec Corp. And uh, First Exec was uh, Fred Carr was the uh, owner. Uh, well, one of the owners. He was the CEO. And he was a big go-go fund guy. Uh, he had uh, the Enterprise Fund, I think, back in the '60s. Uh, when was it? '60s or '70s? When, when you know, those in those days, these mutual funds were really hot. And uh, he made a fortune on that. And then they ended up buying a very small insurance company, which had a catchy name, among other things, in Beverly Hills. And it was Executive Life. And they they bought the company. It was just a little tiny thing. And uh, thanks partly to good marketing and good products, but primarily to having something that's easy to market. He, he came up with products because he was able to manage money so efficiently that he earned more than other insurance companies. He, he earned more than any of them. Mm. Uh, and he was able to then offer lower premiums and he was, at, he was able to offer uh, better paying annuities and he grew very rapidly. He was Michael Milken's first institutional client. Oh, wow. 
And uh, his portfolio, they called it junk bonds, but they were amazing, uh, amazingly uh, high-performing quality stocks. They just didn't quite qualify to be rated above the junk bond level. Mm -hmm. Since since then, they, they did a lot of them got pretty junky. But uh, he, he got to be a Fortune 500 company in just a few years. And I had the Master General. There were three Master General agencies. I had the biggest one. And I think I did. There was... Well, I had I had I had the, the highest producing producers because I just went after the people at that time that were earning a million dollars or more a year. Uh, if you don't know this, most of us do. Uh, but when you buy a whole life insurance, your uh, the first premium you pay, it just all goes to commissions. Uh, some companies are offering 125 percent, mm. so you build no cash value. It's a, I hate it. I, I sold insurance for a very short period of time, and I used to argue with the guy that um, that owned the company, you know, the, the the agency all the time, and I said this is a crappy deal. How about term insurance? But so I, I really found that I enjoyed talking to these high producers. They were interesting guys mm -hmm. and very successful. I mean, making a million bucks a year back in the in the 70s, 80s. That's a, that's a lot of money now, but it was a fortune then. Right. And um, I managed to recruit a bunch of them. Um, more came as word of mouth and you know, a lot of travel. And it was fun going out everywhere I went. Uh, like I say, most of these guys were characters. They were interesting. They were sharp. And then I'd go to new, different cities all the time, a lot of places I'd never been before, and you know, find hotels with a gym in them. That was rare in those days, or find one that's close to a gym. And that was my criteria for trying to find where we figure out where I'd want to stay and then trying to find out places to run. So I you know, I'd have guys running with me and show me where to run and go in at night spots and so it was it was a blast. I it was like a, a constant vacation for me when I was on the road. Uh but uh yeah with we, we brought a lot of premium into the company and uh started selling annuities and uh, the the company actually the master general agency I got hurt uh it, it, then at some point, and I, you know, I lost the business, but uh, the, the, the business kept going. My yeah. partner still had it, brought in another guy, and they uh, it ended up doing uh, a lot. Of, it ended up doing a big, a lot of premium, billions of dollars. Yeah, yeah. we'll get back to that part because I want to ask you about that specifically oh, okay. um, about what happened. But um, so, what was a big lesson you learned from those days? Um, the big lesson I think was. Um, well, other than the business people, uh, the, the business owners had um, had had the most money. And the big lesson I learned was it's just as easy to, well, first of all, you should be an entrepreneur if, if you want a good life, if you want to be the master of your own ship. The other lesson I learned was that a big goal, a big project, is just as easy to manage as a small goal or a small project mm -hmm. because you only have so many hours in the day we all have the same amount of time and you basically if you're going to build a business you do basically the same step step after step after step they're, they're basically the same thing it's different for each business specifically but generally you're, you're going through the same process yeah. so why not think a little bigger why not think way big why not have, try to have the biggest company in the world. Why not do whatever it is? If you're going to do, do it, do it on a grand scale. Uh, your chances of success, you know, you might not be the biggest company out there, but you could be pretty damn big. And uh, your chances of success or failure are basically the same. Yeah. It might be better because if you have higher goals, you start doing things other people aren't doing. If you open a restaurant, you're doing the same thing everybody else is doing. You're trying to be a little more creative or a little different, but same stuff. Yeah. And Dave, with what happened, you know, I always like to ask people on Spider Insider, what's been a low point, what's been a low moment, and how you pushed through it? Oh, gee. When I got hurt, I had a spinal cord injury. Yeah. And uh, that was the lowest point in my life uh, until my mother died. But that, that was uh, definitely the, the, the low point. I mean, it took me a long time to get out of that. Yeah. Uh, mentally, it took me a long time to get out of it. I mean, I was shocked when I listen to your book and you said that because it's almost you know said in a normal tone that kind of not nonchalant but just said kind of a matter of fact what happened and i had to kind of go back and listen to it again to make sure i heard it correctly because it just sounded just like a freak thing 
Oh, it was weird. Yeah, I was lifting and uh, in the gym, and I'd been doing that for years and years and years before that. And I just had a sharp pain at the base of my neck, and I uh, had to stop lifting. And, and I went in and played some ping pong and came back. I just thought I pulled something. And one thing led to another. I worked out for a while, and then pain came back. I, it was crazy. I went over, and the only position I can get in that would relieve the pain would be a fetal position. So I laid down on this padded table that yeah. people would do exercises on. And I was doing, started doing crunches because I could do those. And I, I never and never dreamed that something was going wrong, but I had a hematoma, a slow bleed. Something popped, and yeah. it was just a weakness or something, some weird, crazy uh, freak accident, yeah. and uh, it was a slow bleed, and there was con there was pressure building up on my spinal. It was inside my spinal canal, right? So the blood was slowly pushing on my spinal cord, and uh, I went to the hospital, and they admitted me. Of course, I was screaming like an animal, and they couldn't diagnose it. Wow! So uh, the diagnosis finally was paralysis about a day later. Jeez. And then they rushed me in and did a, 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 what they call a laminectomy. They opened me up, re removed a few of the spinuses, and uh, drained Relieved it. Relieved the pressure. It yeah, it was too late. I mean, what testing did they have in those days? Did they have... Well, you know, CAT scans were rare. They didn't have one there. Uh, they didn't have MRIs. Uh, they did a, uh, what do they call it? Uh, they injected some dye. Uh, when they finally, well, when I finally went paralyzed, they injected dye into my, uh, into my uh, cerebral cerebral spinal fluid, and they, right. they they were looking at it in a, and they were looking at it on a screen or actually on like an X-ray, and you could see the white dye going up to the point of injury, and then it wouldn't go any further, mm -hmm. so it was being blocked. So they they knew there was there was a blockage there, and they that's when they went in. Wow, that is. Uh, yeah, a little, little too, little, little bit too little, a little too late. <laughs> I can't even believe that when I when I heard it, was this like a slow process that it happened, or was it in, almost like you uh, went from? Uh, except for the pain, I could move around freely and and felt you know I had feeling everything. Uh, well, I do now in my arms, but I had feeling in my in my chest and my legs and everything. But then I, all of a sudden, I started getting this tingling feeling, and then I couldn't move. Couldn't move my legs or anything. So wow. my hands either. My hands were. It was a high injury, but the swelling kept my hands from uh, from functioning very well. But they they told me that would I'd get my hand function back. I have, I don't know. I have 80 percent of it probably. So I mean, yeah. it's nor it feels normal to me. It, it doesn't yeah. Like yeah. My wife. They won't allow her to have an epidural for the pregnancy because she's got like a blood clotting disorder and they were worried if they did the epidural that that would happen. Actually, it wouldn't clot. And it would yeah. rush in, and so they wouldn't give her the epidural uh, because of that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, how do you get through something like that? I mean, that's got to be one of the toughest things. Oh, you suffer. <laughs> I mean, I at first I couldn't believe it, and uh, I, I, I just didn't think. I just thought it was temporary. I just didn't know anything about spinal cord injuries. And, you know, you see all the people uh, on television, movies, going through these uh, parallel bars, and they're, they're, they're walking and they're recovering from a war wound or something. And right. that's what I envisioned. I said, oh, geez, I'm going to have to go through all this rehab and uh, gradually get back again. It's going to take a lot of work, but I was ready for that. But then uh, when they finally told me, it didn't tell me right away. They finally told me that I, that, that was it. It was permanent. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I was, you know, obviously, I mean, I was, I was a, a runner, a distance runner, and I lifted all the time. And I had, was a very physical guy. And it just, it all ended. So when that ended... I thought my life ended. I really did. And uh, you know, looking back, I mean, that that part of it ended, but other parts grew. So, yeah. uh, and this too shall pass. <laughs> yeah, Cause I'm, I'm not doing this to depress you, but I'm just thinking, you know, someone who's listening to this, who may be going through something like that, or a family yeah. member going through something like that, something in your mindset that allowed you to get to a better place, I guess. If the, yeah, well, I've, you know, I've, I'm here. If anybody wants to talk to me, I'd be happy to. If anybody has that issue, just e email uh, email Jeremy and, and uh, have him, you know, put me in touch with him. And I've done that over the years, talked to a lot of people. Yeah, uh, It's tough to get through. I mean, it, no matter what you say, you can help. But, I mean, people have to get through it. I yeah. had to get through it. Uh, I kind of shut myself off and just worked it out on my own. Yeah, yeah. Again, I was a little stubborn. <laughs> 
I wouldn't listen. But uh, that helps they, probably. That stubbornness helps in some well, way. Well, like, yeah, they they kicked me out of rehab. I might be the only person they ever kicked out of rehab. <laughs> <laughs> Why'd they kick you out? I was uh, incalcitrant, I guess. I mean, <laughs> they, I, I just kept insisting that there would be a cure someday. Yeah. And because they kept telling me, well, first of all, they they took all my hope away, which I never forgave them for. And I don't forgive the medical co community for that. I hope they're doing better now. But I was, uh, they kept telling me, there's no way I'll ever have any functional use of my legs. I said, okay, I, I hear you. I said, but let's say in the future. Right. Let's say with all, you know, research and break. No, never. As long as you live, you'll never have it. Oh. I said, well, wait a minute. <laughs> I said, how about if they do this, this, and this, you know, generally, because I didn't know anything about physiology at that time, but uh, how about as we learn more and, you know, whatever, I'm just going on and on. Yeah. No. And they would strip all my, and I never forgave them for that because it really put me in a state of depression. And I wasn't very cooperative with them. Um, they, what they were trying to do was just to get me focused on, on, on being able to take care of myself, on being as independent as I could be, right. and being able to function. But the way they did it, they really? stripped me of all hope. And without hope, I mean, there's nothing. I don't care. If, whatever you are, if you're any human at all, and you have no hope, you might as well forget it. I mean, life, even if you struggle through it, even if you live through it, you're just existing. Yeah. There's nothing to look forward to. So um, I just wasn't very cooperative. And they, uh, after I got out, I had a, a serious blood, uh, uh, blood disease, uh, or not a disease, a blood infection. And I was in uh, another hospital in UCLA. And it was a now UCLA is a teaching hospital. So I was lying in this bed, and I had my own, I had a private room in the rehab center, but uh, rehab hospital. But I had, I was in a room with a couple of other guys, or a couple of other patients, a few other ones. And then, you know, in, in teaching hospitals, they bring the resident, they bring the interns in, and, and they, they are in the residents, and, and they, uh, you know, it's, it's an extension of their training after they, after they get their degree. And they have, you know, here comes this woman, doctor, and she would bring her students behind her, and she would was walking up to each bed, and then she'd say she'd look at the chart and she said that she'd read it to them, and then this and that. So she comes up to me. Uh, this is a you know a whatever thirty five year old whatever paraplegic injury from spinal cord injury. Uh, right now he's got this and this and this. I mean, not even looking at me. Hmm. And and I'm going. I said, wait a minute. And, she, she, and I said, and I, I, I wouldn't call her doctor, I should have, whatever her first name was, you know, Sarah or something. I said, Sarah, wait a minute. And I said, and I, I, I didn't feel like I was stepping out of bounds at all. You know, I, I said, you know, I'm, I said, I'm, I don't think I'm any different than most people in here, but probably a, a different than, than, than a lot of them in the respect that what I have, they tell me it's permanent. And just, I said, you're looking at me like a, like a lab experiment. Right. And just a short time ago, I was, I was running and I was on the beach and I was swimming and body surfing and doing all these cool things. And in one day, in a bl almost in a blink of an eye, yeah. this is what you see. Right. And I said, I have emotions. I'm depressed. I think my life came to an end. Yeah. And you come in here. Don't say hello. You don't treat me like a human being. Yeah. And, you know, it, I mean, and if I, I said, if you would just teach your students one thing, mm. have some compassion. Treat people like a human. Not like a, not like a lab rat, and maybe just go up and say hi. I'm so and so. How are you doing? Right. When I want to talk, talk to my student, you know. But she was teaching these people to be crass mm. and to be yeah. just totally, you know, cold and objective. And you're dealing with human emotions in hospitals. Yeah, everywhere, everywhere you go, you're dealing with human emotions. But in hospitals, they're typically, you know, about as low as they can go. So, uh, anyway, so that was the kind of attitude that I, yeah. I saw. In hospitals good for you though yeah yeah thanks i thought you were gonna say then she broke down and cried and said you're right or something no but no I, I was hoping uh i was hoping i only cried once uh not you so, her i'm saying she uh, should she should have oh, should have no yeah no, no she uh she just looked at me she, I mean, nothing no she didn't show any remorse wow. nothing wow. and i was just hoping that i reached at least one of yeah those. that's what i thought you were gonna say like it yeah. changed Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. I know. So, on the flip side, Dave, um, thank you for sharing that. It's, I mean, oh, you're just welcome. Yeah, really tough stuff. And I thought about that in a long time. But, yeah. Uh, 
Um, it's just the attitude. Uh, I think when people have medical training, they should probably screen them before they screen them for uh, aptitude and they screen them for all this and all that. But I think they should screen them for EQ. Bedside manner. Yeah. EQ. If they don't have a, a high EQ, go, go into something else. Be a, be a researcher or something. Go work at a, uh, at a, at a bench with a microscope. Yeah. What's been one of the proudest moments? You know, when I started getting out of this, uh, depression I was in and, um, the proudest moment, well, actually, it was, the proudest moment wasn't getting out of depression. The proudest moment was accomplishing what I did to get out of the depression, which actually which resulted in getting me back in the game of life. Hmm. And that was... Literally, uh, I was, literally life, yeah. Yeah, literally life. <laughs> and I, I was living back in Pennsylvania again. I, went, I actually went around the world. I spent... 15, I didn't believe these people here, so I spent 15 months around the world, mostly in Asia, uh, trying to find a cure because I, somebody told me about this person, that person, so I ended up just following these, you know, these, these grasping for straws. But yeah. uh, after, after it, but my business was gone, everything was gone, my property was gone. So I, I went back to uh, Pennsylvania uh, for a short period of time, I thought, but I ended up being back there a long time. But I, uh, I was kind of vegetating. And I didn't want to go back there. I just thought I'd drop because I, I left from California, landed in New York. So I went to stay with a friend in Philadelphia for a while and then went back to my in Western PA and um, was there for, you know, I was thinking a short time until I regrouped. But I ended up being back there a long time. And, uh, so I started a, 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 a chapter, a local chapter for the Spinal Cord Society. And I was fundraising for research. Mm. And I put on a, a power... A, a drug-free powerlifting event. Uh, it was called American Drug-Free Powerlifting really? Association. Yeah, and I I had the uh, got the I got the the uh, field house at a the local call. It was actually a university. It was a University of Pittsburgh at Johnstown, and I got their field house and uh, and started advertising. And uh, gosh, I brought I call it the Eastern U.S. Drug-Free Powerlifting Championships, and that, we got people from I don't know maybe seven states. Wow, and all these different weight classes and whatever. We had a polygraph guy there testing them for you know, do, you, do you really take drugs or not? And, mm. and uh, it got a, so I got tons of uh, media exposure and newspapers, television, radio. Everything was going out, not just locally but regionally. And then we were mailing these people in the newsletter and got a huge turnout. And uh, you know, I made a little money. I mean, that and I was excited, but. What that taught me was that my, you know, my mind, my brain still works, yeah. and I just it gave me a whole new perspective, and that led to some really interesting things, which ultimately led me to where I am now. Yeah. Uh, I mean, with a life extension, everything at all. It's funny from that one seed, uh, it went to uh, another fundraiser, then some oldies dances, and then I decided to have kind of an extravaganza oldies dance, and I rented the the local uh, hometown arena. Really. And yeah, and I had all these all these bands, and I uh, had a bunch of bands, and from all around the area, I brought people out of retirement. It was kind of a big reunion for all the, you know, the whole the whole community, the surrounding areas, and they came to see their old bands that they used to follow around. And I had a couple thousand people. We only that's huge. Uh, had yeah, great hundred, and ended up selling like two thousand tickets. And I mean, the the arena held more, but uh, for the dance floor and everything, we wanted to hold it to eighteen hundred. Right. And, and and actually made enough money. That was shortly before I left town for California again, and I uh, made enough money to fund the, our first scientific conference, where our first Manhattan Beach. That's where the Manhattan Beach Project oh, got wow. its name. It was in Manhattan Beach, California, the Marriott Hotel, and I uh, searched around and found about twelve people around the country. A couple from one from UK, one from Israel. Uh, I think one might, one might have been from Canada, but I'm not sure. But the rest of them were U.S. All different disciplines. Brought them together, and we had a two-day brainstorm session. And the we were brainstorming on how to reverse aging. Yeah. So uh, it was funny. These guys were and and gals. There was one woman there, were pretty much leaders in their field in their area. Yeah. But only in their little niche, in their in their domain, in their 
and uh, so, so they, they didn't know the other people mm -hmm. doing these other things. Very specific research they're doing. Yeah, and when they met each other and they started talking, magical things happened. Mm -hmm. There was so much synergy. Uh, they were exchanging ideas. They were building on their ideas. You know who Aubrey de Grey is? Sure, I've watched his TED Talk, yeah. Okay, well, Aubrey uh, is quite famous now. Actually, I was on, spoke with him and we're on the, on the stage together in Palm Springs this weekend. For some reason, on your Wikipedia page, his yeah. picture. Somebody is told me the that. Picture. I there. Yeah, I, I went there. And I'm I, like, that's not Dave. That's Aubrey de Grey. <laughs> I thought that was taken down. That's funny. But yeah, know? anyways, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we look a little different, Aubrey. Yeah, a does. little bit. Just a little bit. Down, down it was waste. Uh, yeah, it's just funny. He, but he's, he's a great guy and one of the most brilliant people I ever met in my life. But Aubrey was uh, not known at that time. Now he's, I mean, almost for sure, the, the most famous uh, gerontologist in the world. He's out of Cambridge, uh, UK, and he's living in, uh, in, up in the Mountain View, California now, uh, most of the time. But uh, Aubrey came up with his whole concept there. Really? That's where he got to start. Yeah. Wow. And we had... Uh, we had Michael Rose was there. Uh, he, 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 was, he met a guy from Mathmetrics, uh, the gene chip people, and he never heard of gene chips before. And that, he said that shaved, uh, I think he said, three years or so off his research. Wow. And it shaved, it shaved about 40% 40, uh, 40 off the cost. That's and amazing. other stories like that. So yeah. we, we ended up coming up with a scientific roadmap to reversing aging. Okay, that led into... You know, we call it the Manhattan Beach Project. I got up. I said, "Look, you know, we we, we need." Sounds a official. Sounds good. Yeah, yeah, I said, "Well, we need a Manhattan Project uh, for aging," and we were in Manhattan Beach, and a guy named George Roth. He was uh, an NIH uh, researcher, working on caloric restriction memetics. They looked trying to build a supplement that would do the same thing. There's some good research in your book, by the way, that people have to to look at. Yeah, there, there, in the rats, but yeah. So yeah, so he put his hand up. He said, "Let's call it the Manhattan Beach Project." And so that name stuck, and it was a pretty cool name. So um, from that, uh, then Aubrey ended up having tremendous influences on people, and other people did too. Um, Ray Kurzweil came not on, he, I don't think he ever came to one of those conferences, but uh, he joined the advisory board, mm -hmm. uh, a huge influence on my life, yeah. major guy, uh, got me into the right direction as to, got, got me into artificial intelligence, deciding that was the way to go. The exponential rate of growth uh, kind of solidified my ideas and my uh, projections as to when we're going to cure aging and uh, had a huge impact on my life and he's a good guy too on top of all that. So uh, all these things, uh, maybe not Ray, but all these things came out of this first conference. We had mm. three cents. And um, the I mean, Calico, uh, Google's company now to reverse aging. Uh, was influenced uh, partially by some of these people, and mm. and Aubrey met with them, and all this stuff, and is eventually going to speed up the aging thing. All this stuff, if you if you go back and you trace mm -hmm. back to where this this oldies little oldies dance. I can't believe that. I know, yeah, and it, it's just and it it just changed my attitude totally. My attitude was changed from the powerlifting event. Yeah, and then I got more aggressive. I got. Uh, more involved in in, re in doing fundraisers, and it was a total turnaround, uh, transformation in attitude, and it's just one little change in attitude for one little guy in one little town hmm. who had one little event that kind of blossomed into this this amazing yeah. uh, result. That is amazing, and there are other stories like that. I mean. Almost everything I think that if you find anything that was ever done in a major way, I think if you traced it back, you would find that there was a very humble beginning, a spark that set everything off. Mm -hmm. And um, this is one example as to why big things can grow out of you know small efforts. Mm -hmm. As long as you're persistent, as long as you have a plan, if you follow your passion, just stick with it, stick with it, stick mm -hmm. with it. Make it. If something goes wrong, you analyze it. You, you know, sit back and look at it and take another approach and you just keep hammering at it, hammering at it, hammering at it. And you it just persistence will pay off if you if it's something you really enjoy doing. Dave, you obviously have a talent for bringing people together. I mean, what did you envision that first conference was going to be? I mean, you uh, went from well, oldies to 
getting some of the most prominent. I mean, at the time too, probably some of these people aren't that well known. So they weren't, no, they how do you even find them? And then what did you envision for the? Well, a couple of them were well known within the small circle. Yeah. Of, of anti-aging or life extension research. Yeah. Uh, but so I just went down. You know, the internet was there, and it wasn't nearly as sophisticated now as it is now. It didn't have as much information. But you know, we found the. I had a guy working for me. We found. The, the people out there, he actually dug most of them up. He was a, uh, a biology um, uh, major. He was had a master's in biology, very sharp young guy. Yeah. And uh, so I just started calling them and uh, emailing them and writing to them. And yeah. What did you uh, tell them? I and mean, what did you envision for this? I, I told them the, exactly what we wanted to do. We wanted to do a brainstorm session on how to reverse aging. Really? And we want to take all this, all the, we want to bring people in from all areas of aging research and, and just go in and, and just brainstorm and see what we come up with. And every, not one person turned us down. What made you decide to, to settle on the aging? Because I would think from what the background is, let's work on spinal cord injuries. You know, and you focused in on aging at that point. What was well, I, I, just, I first focused on spinal cord injuries and was raising money for that. But I determined that uh, there are a relative handful of spinal cord injured patients. And I also determined that once we found a cure, I was going to be older. I wouldn't have much longer to live, if, according to the actuaries. And uh, a lot of the research overlaps. Stem cell research, for example. Yeah. And I thought that, uh, I just figured that you know, it couldn't be much more complicated. It is more complicated to solve aging. But it might, it, it didn't seem much more complicated. And there were a lot of parallels. Yeah. But aging affects everybody. Sure. I mean, Every adult, anyway. I mean, until the time from the time you mature, it's all downhill from there biologically. Yeah. So I thought instead of uh, 250,000 people in America, anyway, more around the world, we had more like uh, everybody. Yeah, we had you know 200 million. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, including me. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that, that was That's... my focus. But but also uh, watching my parents age and my aunts and uncles. I mean it. It was. It got to be very, uh, you know. It was very awful to live through and, and to witness yeah. and to be helpless, not be able to do anything about it. Yeah. And so that was the early stage seed of kind of what the Maximum Life Foundation is now. What, what are some, what have been some of the milestones of the Maximum Life Foundation? Well, the big milestone was the scientific roadmap. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, another milestone was uh, raising enough money to launch Age Reversal Inc. And that came out of our last conference in 2009. You saw that, the Manhattan Beach Project. Yeah. On the line, ManhattanBeachProject.com. Uh, those things are all still valid, even though it's several years old. All the videos are up there with presentations. Yeah. Those basic technologies are all the same, right? They're all the same ones, except we didn't cover gene therapy, but we did cover uh, genome engineering. And uh, so we've just sophisticated, or the researchers have, They've advanced pretty far in what they're doing and uh, have gone way beyond where we were then. Rapid last couple of years have been incredible. We've seen a rapid uh, increase in that. So it just feel, feels good to have a part in that, to uh, have, it, have it extended to, uh, uh, to uh, PSYCOG systems, yeah. uh, BioViva, uh, the sciences, and, and turning it into some reality now, human trials, things like that. Yeah. It's just the progress. It's just the journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Dave, you say kind of in passing, you know, we raise money and that's a huge thing. And you were 11 years in private equity. Well, it wasn't that long. Uh, uh, it wasn't. Okay. Yeah, but it was. And it was. Yeah, it was. I was actually in the venture capital business from the standpoint that I was doing very small deals and finding small investors for small deals. It was funny. The way I did it was um, I was actually like shells for a while. And, uh, and I was either advertising those or I was advertising for money. I would run an ad in the Wall Street Journal and the U.S. Uh, and, and uh, business uh, or, uh, or uh, Investors Business Daily and Rob Report and things like that. I would add, I would run ads, little classified ads, sometimes small space ads, but very small direct marketing. And I would uh, say things like uh, Venture Capital Wanted, and then I'd do some copy. And then I'd have another one venture capital available <laughs> and and I would have people looking for money and then I would screen the deals wow. and then I'd find the the deals that made sense 
and it was a learning curve for me too because I was a rookie at this and made mistakes. And uh, some people lost money, and I hate to say it, but they lost money because of my bad judgment. But then other people made a lot of money uh, because of my good luck, you know, <laughs> maybe luck of the draw. But I, I learned quite a bit from it. But yeah, it was kind of cool. It, it, very low overhead. Uh, people would call on both ends, and I just basically get in the middle. And that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you were just having people from both ends come, and, yeah, and you yeah. were connecting them. Yeah, and working out of my bedroom. <laughs> So what did you learn? What's a big lesson you learned from, from those days when you were – because you probably put that into practice with Maximum Life Foundation. Well, gosh, you know, I never really thought about lessons except for some of the things I learned from Galumbos and from uh, Wallace Ward, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Ward. The, um, I guess the biggest lessons were just what I said, persistence, yeah. uh, but passion. I mean, you know what I suggest anybody do if they, if they, unless they're doing something now that they've already committed their life to. If you want to be a success, just shut everything out, go away, go sit in the woods or someplace, or sit someplace where you can have some solitude, and just think, think about what you want. You know, what do, what do you want in life? What do I want in life? Uh, where do I want to be in five years, in, in ten years, in fifty years? Uh, what excites me the most? What what would I do? If I had all the money I needed, what would I do just because I enjoy it so much? Yeah. Figure that out. Figure out really what, if that takes an hour, if it takes a day or a week, or if it takes whatever, how it, two weeks. But figure it out before you do anything else. Because yeah. if you start down the wrong path, you're never going to be fulfilled and you're never going to reach your destiny. So figure out what you're good at, uh, where your talents are. And just do a lot of self-analysis. Talk to your friends. Uh, talk to your business associates. Ask them what they see in you, what, what they think you're good at. Because I think you'll get some very different answers as to what you think you're good at or what you think where your mm -hmm. strengths are. And then um, start planning. Get out a pen or pencil and just write in, in, in longhand. Just start writing a plan and then go back and cross things out and add things and then after it's all done, make your plan. It can be bullet points. Uh, and then the most important part after all that is you want to you know, take that first step. Uh, you you want to you pull the trigger. Yeah. And just pull the trigger, take that first step, follow it by the second step, and just never stop. Because if you're doing something and you're progressing toward a goal that you really, really want, if you have a burning desire for it, you'll build enough momentum, inertia will get you there. I mean, it's not that you don't have to keep reminding yourself, it's not that you don't get thrown off track with you know, min, min, uh, minutia and, 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 and distractions and mistakes, but if you keep your eye on the ball, uh, you'll get there, you know, suddenly it'll happen, it might seem like you're not making any progress, but all of a sudden, boom, something will spring yeah. into place. Yeah. What's been the most challenging, what's the most challenging about running Maximum Life? Um, probably not having the facilities, uh, because I made I made some big mistakes with money, and uh, and poured a bunch of millions actually in, over time into uh, different things. I, I prematurely uh, into the wrong things, betting on the wrong people, and I actually learned uh, a lesson after two, after two picking two wrong partners. Uh, I didn't learn that the first one was a, was a, was the wrong one. Uh, you know how bad the wrong first one was until after I'd already gotten the second one. But um, the the big, I don't know the, the biggest challenge was uh, was was you know recouping from that and then the biggest challenge I'm facing now because I don't have the resources I had at one time is to do a lot of things for myself that I really don't want to do so it's outsourcing I'm not a good outsourcer I know I I'm one of these guys that uh, knows that I hate doing this and hate doing that but what I would almost hate doing more is bringing somebody in recruiting them, training them, yeah. training them, finding, and then finding out there if they are, if, if, if I made a miss, a miss hire, which I've done, I hope I learned how to hire better, then you have to start the whole process over. And meanwhile, the day-to-day -day operations suffer. Right. But I know that's a, that's a cop-out. <laughs> I know that's what I should do. And right. The same I, reason you need to do it is why you don't want to do it. Yeah. Yeah. You no, but time. I'm actually in the process of doing something like that. But yeah. The hardest part about it is uh, the, the minutia and uh, yeah. 
the operational stuff. I'm not an operations guy. I'm more of an idea, you know, kind of creative Imagination, guy. yeah, idea. Yeah, yeah. Who other, what other mentors are important to mention? I know we mentioned Dr. Glombos. Dr. Ward. Uh, Dr. Ward was a, was a chemist. Yeah, I, unfortunately, he was not with us anymore. Mm-hmm. He was uh, very much into life extension uh, philosophy. He uh, was an idea man, uh, author, amazing author, and uh, publisher. And uh, gosh, he, 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 oh, I'm running out, my, my, I'm running out of battery. Uh, um, I'm going to, I think you're going to lose me here in a minute. Jeremy, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to, you're going to lose me. I, my battery's running out. I just got the warning, but um, he was a, a major mentor. Uh, I've had probably a hundred of them. And the reason yeah. I say that, is virtually every good book that I ever read yeah. uh, that has anything to do with um, with attitude, with uh, personal development, with business. Uh, I try to read the best ones, and when I when I do find a really good one, uh, that person, the author, becomes a mentor. Yeah. So I uh, credit a lot of people with contributing to my credo, for example. Yeah. Dave, this has been fantastic. I really greatly appreciate your time and knowledge and everything you're doing. Uh, where should we send people? Where should they check out? Well, you know, maxlife.org, mm-hmm. M-A-X-L-I-F-E.org mm-hmm. uh, is my main page. From there, you'll find a link on the upper left hand, upper left corner of the home page. You'll find a link to Psycog Systems and also to uh, BioViva. Yeah. Uh, those, if you're interested in what, what's going to make all this happen, the technologies, those are two of the key technologies, yeah. and uh, it, so it'll take you to those sites. If you want to find the Manhattan Beach Project, that's manhattanbeachproject.com. Yeah, and those are pretty much it. Yeah, yeah, a lot of information on there. Thank you. You, saw, you read all this stuff. Exactly, it's worth <laughs> it. It's saw, worthwhile. Maybe you did. I don't know if you saw Psychog or Bio. I did. I saw Age Reversal. I didn't see Psychog actually. Yeah, yeah. there now. They haven't so, been up to. Yeah. I'll have to check it out. Okay. But uh, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, really wonderful finally meeting you and, and talking with you. I heard about you and the good things, all good things. Thank you. And uh, maybe we can uh, – where, where are you located? I'm in Chicago, actually. I was reading that's, that your mom – your mom's so originally from Chicago? J- who, Joe? Your mom is originally from Chicago. Oh, yeah, my right. mom. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. My mom was born in Chicago uh, and ended up uh, – her. You know, my grandfather moved to uh, – Johnstown, Pennsylvania, yeah. and uh, worked in the railroad, and that's where she met my dad. She met her at, met him at a wedding, yeah. and uh, it was, yeah, I I held the family reunion for their fiftieth anniversary, and that's amazing. Another one for their sixtieth, so that was uh, wow. a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah, I was going to ask about that on your list of special gratitude too, because obviously I read the whole credo. You yeah. have this list of scientists, and then in the middle you have. Gary C. Halbert, <laughs> which is, I'm like, okay, you have all these people, then you have uh, yeah. one of the best direct response marketers, copywriters. Oh, my God. And, and a character. What a character. He and I were really good friends. In fact, that's how I met Joe Polish. I met Joe through uh, Gary. Yeah. That's so, amazing. But, yeah, it's uh, – I'm sorry. I got off the track. But well, track. What was that? No, you were just saying Gary Halbert. Um, so did he – is that how where you got the idea to put the two ads in there? Yeah, or? yeah actually, actually, no. I mean, the idea was mine, the two ads, but uh, just the idea of you know how to write copy and and I'm not a good copywriter, but I you know for little classifieds I I get by and uh, I just came up with that idea. And uh, then one other idea I came up with was uh, I didn't know I was violating SEC violations, SEC rules. I wasn't in all the ads, but there was there was one thing that. The SEC slapped my hands because I was actually selling a security. I had no idea uh, what was going on. In fact, I invested in the company myself. Was trying to find other investors, and uh, somebody from Kansas complained about it, and uh, and they uh, they came up with uh, uh, they, 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 they somebody they called me one of the securities people. They called the securities guys in Pennsylvania, and I ended up having to pay like five hundred bucks, uh, you know, to cover their cost of investigating mm-hmm. me, but. Uh, and, and not run that ad again, but uh, but I, I ended up uh, getting around that by thinking of and Gary loved this by the way, uh, thinking about well we can't advertise for investors, so I started advertising for partners. You know, partner wanted 
Mm. And, uh, and then in the body, I say financial partner with expertise in this, 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 and that we want to partner for this. So it, it, it accomplished the same thing. I actually got a better response. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so Gary did like that a lot. Yeah. Should I uh, cut that out, or are you allowed to say that? No, no. I, okay. I, that's, that's a matter of record. Yeah. I, okay. Yeah, that's the. Uh, I just I didn't know. You know, made a mistake. And, it's. Uh, well, I mean, it was, this, you, know, I, you have such great stories. This could go for. Uh, you know, the next we we could like the sun could be coming up. Like we should do Doctor Colombo style. Well, well, do you ever come to California? Of course, yeah. Well, like, look me up when you come out here. I'm in Newport Beach. Okay, I will definitely yeah. do that. My number and everything. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.